Hi everybody, it's Guy McDudefella, one of the co-chairs of the Proving Ground Track at B-Sides Las Vegas. Our next talk is Breaking the Giants with Logic by Ali Kabil, who was mentored by Nick Rosario. Um, hello everybody and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. Um, it's a pleasure to be upon you here today, at least virtually. I'm Ali Kabil and today we'll be talking about Breaking the Giants with Logic. So let's kick off with some who am I. Um, I'm a computer science engineering student at the German University in Cairo. I have been a bug hunter and a security researcher for um, around six to seven years now. Um, mostly my research interests revolve around web application security, network security, and um, security in new architectures like microservices. Um, something I'm extremely passionate about is exploiting vulnerabilities in web applications and networks, uh, barehanded without using tools, just by using my, basically my brain um, it's my first time here to be a speaker besides Las Vegas, and if you would like to connect with me, you can find me at Logic Breaker on Twitter and at Kabil on LinkedIn. So um, before we start, I would like to take a second to look at the title of the presentation, Breaking the Giants with Logic. So there are two very interesting words here, which are the giants and logic. So if you have had a look at the bio of the presentation, you should know that the giants refer to big um, social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and so on. But now let's take a look at the other part, which is logic. Um, I want to take a step back and talk about logic before actually the era of security and that's all. Just logic in science, in mathematics, in physics and so on. So logic is basically what people think is right, what people think is wrong, a set of rules or a set of um, intuition that people think makes sense. So, for instance, if you wake up today, it's extremely sunny, you tell your friend it's going to rain, he will tell you this is not logical, because this doesn't make any sense, there is no proof for that, there is nothing that actually um, say that this will happen. Um, so this is logic in real life. Um, like everything, uh, computer science actually is very heavily relied on logic, so let's take a look at this code, for instance. Um, the developer here just tries to create a very simple function that given two numbers will return the summation of those two numbers. Um, seemingly there is a typo here where instead of using a plus sign to add them, he used the multiplication sign to multiply. So this code will compile. Um, it will fact run correctly, there will be no problem, but the results here will be actually not expected. You add one to two and then you get two because there is not addition, it's multiplication. So this is something like the simplest logical vulnerability that you can find. It's not a security vulnerability, it's a security bug. It's basically something that makes the code not useful for you. You are trying to add, but then you get to multiply. Um, moving forward, um, as I told you, I have been a bug hunter for around six to seven years, and there is one thing that really frustrates us bug hunters, which is duplicates. Duplicates are extremely frustrating. Uh, for those coming from non-bug hunting uh, backgrounds, let me tell you what duplicates are quickly. Duplicates are basically reporting security vulnerabilities or bugs to, uh, to firms or and companies and so on. And they told you, okay, we already know about this vulnerability. It's known internally. Another researcher reported and so on. So you invest a long time searching for the vulnerability, writing a long re report and so on, and you end up with nothing because somebody else was faster than you. And from my humble experience, I can tell you that Usually duplicates arrive from the uh, people using same tools all the time. So I'm not against automation. I extremely love automation, but there is something about it that makes it a little bit a cause of duplicates. People use exactly the same tools against exactly the same website. So they end up with the same results. They report it. And it's extremely rare unless you are very lucky that those um, vulnerabilities will be valid because people report those all the time. So it's not a big chance at all. The issue here is, um, if you ever got stuck before in the friend zone and you think it's a bad place to be, think about the duplicate zone. The duplicate zone is a horrible place to be. I have seen some great talents quit because they can't tolerate the amount of duplicates. Um, and after thinking a little bit, I thought that the best way to get out of the duplicate zone is one of two ways. The first way is just be extremely tech savvy, take years studying, coding and so on, and dig deep into um, frameworks like Laravel, find zero days and report them. And that's something that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and so on. Um, but there is an easier way to do it, which is just using your brain. Get out of the code, um, get your eyes off the code and start thinking what the application I'm testing is supposed to do. 
what I can do to make it change that behavior. So a very good example of that, if we take an e-commerce platform, for instance, you're just buying some goods and then they are like totaling $100. And now what you're doing is you just going to check out and then you think, okay, uh, before I go to check out, I will just press buy and capture the request using a proxy like verb suite, for instance. So you do that and then you find a very weird parameter in the, um, in the code. Uh, this parameter is called the price. So you change the price from $100 to $1 and allow the request to pass in peace. And then eventually you kind of find yourself buying only all those goods for $1. And that's actually a huge vulnerability here. You are buying things for $1 or $0.1 while they can cost thousands of dollars because the developer didn't pay enough time uh, to validate this point to make sure that people won't tamper it. He relied on front end validations and so on that he will be sending the uh, parameter right away. So now, this is one example of a serious security vulnerability in e-commerce website. So um, before we go on to the case studies, I would like to take uh, uh, some time to get a bit of theory. And let's borrow some definitions and theory from our friends at OpenASP and Portswigger. Um, the, they define business logic vulnerabilities as those vulnerabilities that can impact the business adversely. They are usually not easy to find and not easy to protect against because they rely on the unique thinking of the attacker. It's about how people um, approach your application, how people think about this feature, you may, you, you may say it seem a very honest and innocent feature, and then this innocent feature can turn out to be devastating, for instance. Uh, one example of that is the reset password. The reset password is one of the most useful features. You just use it to reset your password whenever you forget it. So let's assume that you forget your password that other day on example.com. You go to this reset password, you enter your email, you got an email, and the email had two fields a user ID and a token. So now you thought as a security researcher, that user ID is an integer and it seems to be incrementing integer. So what will happen if I just decrement it or increment it a little bit and see what happens? So you do that, you write your new password and you find yourself in a totally different account than yours. And you have got a full account takeover just by manipulating that um, parameter. This is another example of business logic vulnerability. Um, the user, the, sorry, the developer here didn't take care that he should be tying the, that specific token to that specific user ID. He just checked. Is the token okay? Yes, it's okay. And it may be a very strong token with very strong cryptography that's not easily breakable. And then he just say, okay, is it a valid user ID? Then just reset the password and you've got a full account takeover that way. Um, another very unique uh, system that I have been hunting for long are the hacking invitation systems. Um, hacking invitation system is one of the examples of uh, finding lo business logic vulnerabilities, and let's see how this goes. So here I'm talking about invitation systems using emails. So you got the invitation on email. So let's assume that we have uh, one of those social media platforms, and then you have something like a group structure where you can invite people to groups and so on. And the admin sent you an invitation to join the group. So the invitation looks something like that, example.com, and contain some interesting parameters highlighted here, group ID, sender ID, member type, token, and so on. So the first thing I would think when looking at this, I found the group ID, and it's a numeric one. So what will happen if I change that group ID? So for instance, I change it from one to three to any other thing, maybe one to two. Will I be able to join that group? If that happened, this is definitely a security vulnerability here. And it's not something that uh, tightly related to the code because this will trigger no errors. It will just do it correctly, but you're not supposed to join the group. There is no check that prevents you from doing so. Um, if you have ever been on Clubhouse, for instance, you can see that when you join uh, Clubhouse, you will have um, something under your profile saying um, you were invited by so-and-so. So here we have the sender ID, and let's assume that this is an invitation to Clubhouse. And then you change the sender ID to a celebrity name. And um, now this is the celebrity account ID. And you use this invitation link. And now it says on your profile that you were invited by the celebrity so and so. Now you can claim that you know that celebrity. This can help you extremely in fraud. It can help you to get publication that's not yours, and so on and so forth. Because again, this is not a checked parameter. Uh, in groups, usually, there are some kind of admins, moderators, members, and so on. So the member size indicates which privileges you are having. So let's assume that you change it, that one in the member size, and then you type it to be a zero or type it to be a two uh, and so on. And you find yourself 
uh, doing some privilege escalation. So instead of being a member, I change it to, to and now I'm an admin or I'm moderator. So you have done some privilege escalation because member type again is not just checked. And then we can find the token and the token usually um, can suffer from things like weak cryptography, can suffer from things like being brute forceable and so on and so forth. Um, this is about um, what we can see and observe in the link itself, but taking a step back and thinking about behind what we see, we can see that there are other examples where we can abuse this invitation system. For instance, um, let's assume that you send this invitation to your friend and then you both can join the group using the same invitation. So you and your friends can join using the same invitation. Now let's assume that the group implies some kind of um, access control where the admin should approve you, but because the admin sent you the invitation, it's already approved. And now you are using that invitation to invite others. So you are doing some kind of privilege escalation again, because you are approving people to groups and you shouldn't be allowed to do so. Another very interesting uh, example of abusing this is being able to use the invitation multiple times yourself. So you join the group, and then you leave the group, you use the invitation, you join the group again, and so on. This can be extremely nasty, especially if an admin just threw out of the group because you violated the rules and so on, and then you can just use the invite to get back in, and there is nothing they can do. So this can get really bad here. Um, some of you might think that this is purely theoretical and it might not exist in real life, but the case study will prove you wrong. Um, so we have two interesting case studies here. The first is about creating ghost users in Facebook groups, and the other is about how to become an invisible stalker on Instagram. So I have been spending a lot of time uh, hunting invitation systems, especially that of Facebook groups, and I have found some interesting vulnerabilities that I will be sharing with you. So the idea of joining multiple times indeed existed. You could just use the same invitation link to join the group, leave the group, join the group, and so on. So this indeed existed in Facebook. It was not just imaginary vulnerability. Um, joining with friends also existed. You were able to join with your friends. You just share the link and then you all join at the same time and the link will work perfectly. It, it doesn't really um, have any problems with that. So again, you violated the admin controls. Um, the most interesting one was joining as a ghost user. So. Facebook has that something like um, the preview mode in groups where you actually uh, appear to be um, seeing the group. You are not yet a member, but you are seeing the group to accept or reject the invitation. Usually this is intended just because you uh, get an invitation, you go to the group, you see it, okay, I'll join it or I'll not join it. But I was thinking, what will happen if I stayed in that preview mode? So seemingly there was an interesting security vulnerability that once you get into the preview mode by clicking on the invitation, you didn't accept and you didn't reject. You just preview the group. Now the invitation disappears from the admin panel of the group. They can't remove that invitation. At the same time, you are not a group member. So you are stuck in the state where you can see the group. You can join it anytime, but the admins can't remove you. So now you are a ghost user and you can join anytime, potentially saying things that you are not authorized to, to see because admins can't simply remove you. So Facebook solved that by trying to do a lot of fixes but one of the interesting fixes was actually moving the feature altogether from the new UI in Facebook. Um, so I was thinking, is that a limit for me? So I no longer can exploit this vulnerability, but then I thought maybe I should look a bit um, into that application behind the front end. So I tried to create a normal invitation, not a group invitation, and send it to my proxy at Verb Suite. And I saw that the email parameter that I used to exploit was still there. It's not visible from the front end, but the back end still have it. So I thought, okay, maybe I will try it. And I submitted an email and I was able to actually invite somebody to join the group, even though there's no feature like that in the front end. The bugs were back to life because the back end system was still there. This is another logical vulnerability here is that you just assume that whenever you remove a front end, nobody knows about your back end system, nobody can exploit them. Security through obscurity doesn't always work because people sometimes already know about it. Um, so that's about Facebook and invitation system. Now we'll be having a look at Instagram and how to become an invisible stalker on Instagram. So stalker nowadays changes from before. They no longer stand behind trees like that guy in the meme. Um, stalkers now usually use social media. So to be a stalker, there are two main points that you do. You shouldn't be detected anyway. If people detected you, they will be anxious when dealing with you and it wouldn't be the, really that nice at all. The second thing is you should have full permanent access to your victim's social media. The more you are on their social media, the more you know about them, and the more you can achieve your bad stalking deeds.
and then I can tell you, happy stalking now, you can do it. Um, so thinking about it, I was on Instagram that day and I was thinking, okay, so Instagram had this feature of blocking people and following them, like any social media platform. So I had that person that I didn't really like, so I thought about blocking them. So I just blocked them and then I found something really interesting. When I blocked them, the follow button was still working. So there was still that follow button. So I think this is really weird. How can I block them and then I can just follow them? So I said, okay, I will open my test account. I block my test account and follow it. And now the magic happens. You are blocking somebody, so they can see you. You won't appear in their followers list or anything, but you, at the same time, you are a follower to them. So it's more or less that you are blocking them. They can see you, they can see your comments. Um, they can find you in the friend list and so on, but same time, you are just in their followers list. You can see their pictures, you can see their friends, um, you can like their comments, and they will not even see that you like them, and so on and so forth. So basically, you are permanently there in their Instagram account. They have nothing to do. They don't know you even exist. Um, so this was another example of a business logic vulnerability. It's, it's not something that's triggering an error in the code. It's about thinking, how can somebody block and follow some but at the same time, it doesn't make any sense. So moving forward, um, I would like to share some final thoughts before I conclude this presentation. The first of which is how to kick off finding a business logic vulnerability. So business logic vulnerabilities are not easy to find because they rely on your unique thinking. So I would encourage you to just use the application as a normal user, avoid sending a ton of requests and automating everything before you actually use the application. Use automation, but also use the application as a normal user. Get to know which features are working, which features are not working, which features can be exploited. And the other thing that you can use to learn about business logic vulnerabilities, read previous reports. Reading previous reports is extremely um, helpful here. You can read it from things like HackerOne or otherwise, you're free to do so, but they have uh, many insightful ideas about business logic vulnerabilities. And the nice thing is those flows re-exist. So invitation systems that I was talking about may exist in Twitter, may exist otherwise, they exist in nearly all social media platforms. So you can try the same way of thinking in other places and it may work with you. So yes, business logic can be reused. A vulnerability in an e-commerce website most probably can exist in others too. So that's another thing to do using business logic. Um, now moving forward about uh, what I plan to do in the future, um, although I'm not a big fan of automating things altogether, but I think that automating um, is good once you get a grasp of the application. So I want to work on something like a framework that will incorporate everything that I have learned about business logic vulnerabilities or the interesting vulnerabilities that I have came through and try to automate finding them in other websites. So for instance, automating finding uh, bugs in invitation systems in other social media platforms or other platforms that use um, invitation systems. So finally, I would like to um, take this chance to thank my mentor at Chainbox. I would also um, thank you, Nicholas. I would also like to thank at Symbian, Simo, at Zigo, and at Cermetrix. Those people helped me a lot during my journey. They are extremely talented security researchers, and I would encourage you to invite them, uh, sorry, to follow them because they, ha they have very insightful tweets regarding security and so on. So um, that's about it. Thanks for watching, and um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them now. That was great. So let's get to some questions. Uh, our first question is from Social Chen Engineer. Uh, so re regarding invite, leave, invite, leave, invite, leave, which is your, I think your first uh, uh, example, could that lead to a type of uh, denial of service or? distributed denial of service against the application? Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's really hard to do so because um, joining and leaving would just be mapped to something like adding an invitation to the database and removing it from the database. So it's really hard to do that at scale. Um, also, the fact that you need an invitation in first place means that you will need a lot of different invitations to execute that at scale. So I don't think that the most abundant attack would be a denial of service or a distributed denial of service in that case. Sure. I, yeah, there's that's an it's an edge case. It's doable, but it would be it'd have to be a pretty slim edge case, I would think. 
Um, yes, and it really depends on how invitations are stored. If they are not removed when the person just uh, go out of the group, so we are kind of filling up the database with uh, junk invitations. In that case, it may lead to some kind of denial of service attack. Yes. Sure. Okay. Uh, how often you talk about finding business logic issues in the back end, even though features have been removed in the front end, how often would you find an issue in back end versus front end, would you say? Um, more often than people would think, because uh, usually um, when a feature is removed or when the front end changed, um, the back end is not cleaned completely. Uh, so sometimes endpoints are still exposed in the back end. So this happened multiple times that actually I know that the front end uh, endpoint exists and I have already even tested it. So I have some uh, knowledge of the endpoint or the request structure and so on. And when I submit it again, uh, it actually works even though it no longer exists in the front end. Okay. What about, so to sort of follow up to that question, I mean, it's one thing to find an issue with, you know, functionality that remains in the back end, despite the code being removed from the front end. What about things like um, undocumented API hooks, where there used to be functionality or used to be a feature that supported, was supported by a, a company in a framework, and they've deprecated it but it still exists. How often do you find stuff like that? Mm, it's really not straightforward to find. You will have to dig deep, mm -hmm. deep into the application. So it's not as common as already knowing the endpoint. But yes, of course, it happens. Uh, but you need to dig into something like um, Wayback Machines and so on to gather endpoints that are depreciated and they are not present now. So um, you need to do a lot more work the, when it's not documented. Usually the easiest way to do it is just visiting all documentation. So if all documentation exists and this endpoint was there, maybe you can find something worthy looking at. Sure, sure, sure. So you've, you've focused on, in, in this talk, you focused on Facebook and on Instagram. What's piquing your interest now? Uh, wh where have you been looking? Um, actually, I've been looking into Snapchat for a pretty long time. Um, there are a lot of things that I've actually managed to exploit there. Um, most of them are not yet uh, published, but one thing that's uh, really interesting about uh, Snapchat, for instance, is what they call a second order denial of service attacks. Second order denial of service attacks are basically attacks where the attacker can store uh, junk data in the database with huge amounts and then if uh, this database is shared with other users, you can just um, cause the line of service attack to this user when you sure. try to retrieve the data because they are retrieving a huge amount of data. So basically, the attack is as simple as filling the database with a lot of information, and then when the user tries to retrieve this data, the request takes a lot of time and it finds out. So they are denied from entering the sure. uh, application. I would imagine that could also lead to other issues related to concurrency and disk usage and stuff like that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't get that. I, I, was, I would, as a result of not only just filling database with junk data and making it, making the application take mm -hmm. time to retrieve it, I could see that also running into issues of database concurrency as well yeah. as um, disk usage, resource utilization. Yes, of course. Definitely. Right. Well, um, one thing that you had mentioned uh, to me prior to us coming on for Q and A was uh, the proof of concepts for those vulnerabilities. Would you like to talk about where we could find those? Uh, yes, of course. All the uh, vulnerabilities discussed in the talk uh, can be found on the security blog. Security is the company where I work at now, the application security intern. So they are documented with videos there. Um, I will be posting the link directly on Twitter after this talk so people can find okay. it easily. Also on the Discord channel, of course. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great talk. Uh, you know, business logic is always something that's overlooked and yet it's you know the underpinnings of everything we do. So it was, I think, I think very well received and I really appreciated it. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Sure. Absolutely.